called? It's a Raj. Hey guys, I'm here with Siraj. She's the director of the School of AI and has a super popular YouTube channel all about AI. Siraj, you want to tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah, for sure. Um, I teach people AI full time on YouTube. That includes, you know, the most advanced cutting edge algorithms that you're going to see in the news to the very basics. And I try to do it in a way that's easily ex understandable by the general population, not just developers, but but really anybody. That is awesome. So today I'm here interviewing Siraj. I'm going to ask him a ton of questions about AI. And, you know, I, I know a little bit about the basics of AI, but um, Siraj is told we're going to go super in depth, so get excited. Um, and a lot of times you hear AI, you hear the terms AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and they're very buzzwordy topics. Everyone talks about them, but no one, you know, a lot of people know what they mean, but no one really knows what they mean. What, do you, what, what, what is your definition of artificial intelligence? To... Uh... AI is any software that has an objective, that has a goal. So um, anything from a calculator to um, a robot that's walking, I consider to be AI. It's, it's, it's a very generic term for software. And uh, I'm not, I mean, I'm not too, I'm not too religious about using it specifically for, for one thing. I just think of AI just in general as as what it is, artificial intelligence, right? It, it, it does things that our intelligence could do, but running off of software. And so I've also heard that artificial intelligence has a lot to do with mathematics. And like there's training data and there's, you know, test data and there's all these terms. Can you break down like some of the, like what are some of the common terms you'll hear when studying machine learning or AI? Yeah, if you take a university level machine learning course, then they will talk about math. They'll talk, um, I mean, I remember my machine learning course at, in college that I that I did really badly in, to be honest. I made like a C or a D in it. But uh, it was just slide after slide after slide of equations. And that that was very disheartening. That was very discouraging to me. Um, looking back, I think it's hilarious because we now live in a, an age where you literally, you don't need to know, you, you basically only need to know like addition, subtraction, division, and multiplication to, 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 to use AI because there are tools both in the form of libraries, in the form of web apps, Google Colab, Kaggle Kernels, Keras, TensorFlow. Um, TensorFlow is one of the, uh, TensorFlow is a little more in, in depth than more detailed than the rest, but where you don't necessarily have to know any math, just like I said, addition, subtraction, division, multiplication to use AI. However, if you really want to understand it in its true detail, yes, you need to know some math. But the the, the good part of that is that all of this math um, is, there's, there's now so many resources to explain the math of machine learning that did not even exist a year ago. And I'm not just talking about my channel. I'm talking about uh, Daniel Schiffman the, of the Coding Train on YouTube. I'm talking about Andrew Trask, who you can follow on Twitter, who's a deep mind researcher, who's making amazing blog posts. Um, and really, at this point, you can just um, search on Twitter the hashtag 100 Days of ML Code, which is a, an initiative that I started recently to get people to code machine learning for one hour every day for 100 days. A part of this initiative, they're creating these like infographics and these like very colorful, um, interactive descriptive tutorials on AI that are helping them in their journey and they're sharing it, which, so it's a, it's a really exciting time to be in the space. Awesome. Yeah. That's so, yeah. Whenever I think of machine learning, I always think it's those equations and it's all this complicated math and I'm sure, yeah, it's definitely based on that, but now with all the different resources that are out there, it's accessible to even, you know, the front end developer, the back end developer, whatever, you know, type of developer you consider yourself to be, it's definitely accessible to you, it sounds like. For sure. Yeah. And 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 I'm not gonna, you know, try to convince any of your audience that um, math is easy. 
It's not. I mean, there's a reason why there's a reason why it's considered hard in general because math is a is is it's it's a hard thing to both teach and to learn. And uh, you know, most of us, myself included, never had a good math teacher. Um, mm. You know, as good as they could be, but that's not the math teacher's fault. It's just it's a it's a hard topic to it's it's, it's a very challenging topic. So, but the good the the, the good side of the the coin is that. Um, if you focus specifically on the math for machine learning, everything else becomes easier, both the, the, the programming, the naming conventions, the concepts, the theories. If you focus on the hardest part, part which is the math, then everything else becomes easier. So let's assume someone's a programmer. They know how to do some JavaScript, some Python. You know, they know the basics, the foundations of coding. Like, how would you suggest they get started in making things with AI or just learning AI in general? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, of course, my playlists on YouTube, Intro to Deep Learning is a good one. The Math of Intelligence is another one. And uh, that's, and then I my most my most recent one, Machine Learning Journey. All of these are free playlists on YouTube that are meant for people who know a little bit of code. Um, that's the only prerequisite to know basic Python syntax. And then, mm. you know, I'll, I'll try to teach as much math as I can in the course. But um, there's, you know, I think the most popular one is the Andrew Ang machine learning course on Coursera. However, I, I think that course could be, it's a little too difficult for beginners. That That's, that's a graduate level course. So I think a better mm. starting point besides my playlists are... Uh, you know, at this point, I mean, I've been doing this for two and a half years and, and similar to you, like I put additional resources inside of my videos and my videos are, you know, kind of starting points to learn more. So I have in all of those videos, links to blog posts and, you know, all sorts of things that are going to be great resources. Awesome. And like, what would you, I know there's a lot of types of machine learning, like what is a typical AI tech stack? So usually, you know, you have your mean stack, like that's, you know, a developer stack. Do you have something similar in artificial intelligence or machine learning? Yeah, yeah, there is. So, um, so the way um, AI works in production, the way it's actually used by people, you know, by, by these companies like Google and Microsoft is you're gonna train some model, some algorithm. This could be 10 lines of code, this could be 100 lines of code, but you're gonna train it on some data. This could be images, this could be videos, it could be text. And once it's trained, then you have this model wait file. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's one file that stores everything that it's learned. And we wanna take this model wait file and serve it to people. And you know, for, for example, image classification or uh, for self-driving cars or whatever the use case. And the way to serve that model is to create this larger framework of showing the newest model. And in the background, a new model is training. And when it's done training, then we, re we reset it. So this newer model. And, then, and so the, the framework for that, um, one great example is called TensorFlow Serving, which lets you serve TensorFlow models in real time and show the ones that are most up to date at a time, but create this pipeline to allow new models to to percolate up the stack. So the stack looks like a serving layer, which talks about which deals with naming conventions, versioning for models. You have the model itself, which is on top of that, and then underneath that, it's you've got Python, you've got your basic database like a SQL Server, and then you have any web framework of your choice from Flask to um, Node. Cool. Awesome. It's good to know. It seems like it's very modular and that like machine learning is almost just a component that you can add to an application, like an iOS application or an Android application or a web application. It's really just another thing that your backend code might be accessing. Is that right? Or Exactly. Exactly. For now. Eventually, eventually, if we're talking five to 10 years in the future, then uh, we're going to start seeing every single part of the stack apply this machine learning technology to it. I'm talking mm -hmm. about the lowest levels that people would never think, like operating systems, right? 
Right now, there are a set of rules that people who create operating systems for both computers, like a MacBook, like what I'm running, and also servers in the cloud that are rule-based, that say, you know, allocate X amount of memory for this task. But this can actually be made better with machine learning, where instead we say, learn, computer, what the best amount of memory to allocate would be. Don't just say it, but learn in the context of this time with this amount of resources based on what the user is doing. So from the very bottom of the stack, I'm talking networking, operating systems, compilers for programming languages to the very top. Uh, machine learning is going to be everywhere, but right now it is one component of the stack. And wh what do you mean when you say a like a computer is learning? Like, oh, that's a term you hear a lot with machine learning. Like the machine is learning, the computer is learning something. How does that process work? What does that mean? Yeah, so right now, uh, for example, if I want to create some kind of app or program that can recognize some image, the traditional way of doing this in programming terms would be to say, detect, you know, like let's say I'm trying to detect um, a, a basketball. So I would say first, check if it's a circle. Second, check if it's orange. Third, check if it's got black lines on it. Um, and that could work. But the problem is that there are so many different types of basketballs out there and that come in all different shapes and colors and sizes that this would be a very, re very redundant and inefficient pro approach to the problem. So a learning approach would be to say, instead of saying, check for these features for what a basketball looks like, let me just give this program a lot of images of different types of basketball. And what it will do through this optimization process, popularly known as backpropagation, to be a little technical, is that it will look at all of these images of basketballs and it will develop a general representation of what they all look like simultaneously. And then using this general representation, if you give it a new picture, ideally, if it's learned properly, it will be able to classify it as a basketball. So from the description you gave, are all machine learning algorithms, is, is it basically just classifications? We're giving it a bunch of data and then it classifies, you know, hot dog, not hot dog, is, you know, Silicon Valley, but that idea? Or are there different types? And that's like a loaded, that's definitely a loaded question. I'm sure there are more types, but. Yeah, there are more types. Classification is an easy example. That's very, um, it's a good introductory example, but. Um, a lot of models can generate new types of data. Um, and by generate new types of data, that could be uh, new types of Pokemon, for example, if you're talking about something funny. But if you want to get serious, it could be generating a video of anybody saying anything that looks photorealistic. And that's happening. That's happening now. Um, but yeah, you can basically create entirely new virtual worlds that didn't exist before. Um, you can generate new types of cures to diseases. Um, that's drug discovery, which I think is going to be very prominent in the next three to five years. But both generative models and classification models are the, the most popular type, but the rabbit hole goes pretty deep. So the machine can learn from us. It can learn from our actions. It learns from the data that we give it. Should we be afraid of AI? Like, will AI ever get too smart and outthink us, in a sense? If it's already, if it's going to be building these new worlds, these new compilers, are we needed? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Um, we, uh, so in the in the immediate term, um, in the next five to ten years, I think it's very unlikely that we're going to get AI that's smarter than all humans, um, but. Um, an immediate concern would be certain power structures that are misaligned with the interest of the general population not using AI for their own benefit that would be detrimental to society at large. So, um, you know, it's, it's hard. It's, I don't want to name any names, but we're talking about certain <laughs> nation. We're talking about nation states and we're talking about very powerful institutions that could use AI in a, in a in a harmful way for humanity. In the long term, it would that then yes, AI might become self-aware. It might become smarter than all humans. But hopefully by then we have a set of values, a set of safety guidelines that we've created that 
maximize the probability that it's going to be beneficial for humanity. And we need to start the work to prevent both bad cases, both in the near term and the short term now, by educating ourselves, each of us individually, on how this technology works. Awesome. Yeah, I totally agree. We all should understand this type of technology because it is going to play such a big role in our lives and in the future, you know, as it develops. So we kind of got an idea of how to get started in AI, what artificial intelligence means, you know, should we be afraid of it or not, and really how it works. I know you've built School of AI, so maybe you could talk a little bit about what School of AI is, how someone can get involved. For sure. Right now, School of AI is a nonprofit that I've created that's dedicated to teaching AI to people for free. And right now I have 800 what I call deans that are city leaders, city leaders across 400 cities globally, and they are building local communities to teach people AI. Um, that's what's happened so far. Um, coming up next is, uh, well, I'm in talks with, you know, Intel and a few other companies on ways of creating a, a research grant program for people and also, of course, more educational content across the board. But uh, it's only been three weeks, and uh, yeah, it's been an adventure for sure. That's awesome. And how did you even come up with the idea? Like, why? You know, you have a, you, your, a, your YouTube channel is very much based on AI. You have the school of AI now. You have your Instagram, of course. What inspired you to, like, create all this? And why focus on artificial intelligence versus something else? Yeah, we, we have a lot of hard problems to solve in the world that are existential threats to humanity that could wipe us out. And I think AI is the best, not I think, AI is the best um, potential solution we have to solving those problems in our lifetime. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Siraj, and thank you guys for watching. Um, I hope you learned something new in this video. And be sure to check out Siraj's videos. His will be down below. Be sure to subscribe. And thank you for watching. Happy coding.